Welcome. Welcome to Climate Forum 2020. This is an important election. And we want to thank our candidates for being here tonight. Running for office is no small feat. And we appreciate your commitment to good government and your commitment to our climate. I wanna thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight and share your perspective on important environmental issues facing Louisiana. I also want to thank you, our attendees, for being here tonight and for taking the time to learn about the various candidates and their position on environmental issues. Um, just a couple of housekeeping issues. Please note that this event is being recorded and may be publicly posted in the future. By registering and participating, the candidates and attendees agree to be recorded. So thank you. The other housekeeping issue is that this forum is strictly informational. None of what is said here tonight by the candidates should be construed as an endorsement by Climate Forum 2020. We are just holding this forum because we want you guys and us, frankly, to be able to make an informed and educated choice on who we want to vote for on November 3rd. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over the format for this Climate 2020 Forum. The first thing that we will have on our agenda is a five minute presentation by Edgar Cage on Louisiana's constitutional amendment number five. After that, we will cover three races. The first will be the race for Louisiana Public Service Commission. And this race, this uh, particular race will be moderated by, moderated by Angel Bradford. The second race will be Louisiana Congressional Districts 1, 2, and 6. Those questions will be moderated by Pooja Brazil. And last will be the United States Senate race. And that race will be moderated by um, Deron Joyner. Each candidate will get one and a half minutes for an opening statement. There will be two questions for each race. Our questionnaires will ask each candidate the same question. Uh, and these questions came from a written questionnaire that we sent to our candidates that, were, that is available to you. The candidates will have one and a half minutes to answer the question. You'll know when the time is up because there will be an audible beep. But we also have a timekeeper. Penny, preach it, uh, wave your hand. Okay, she's gonna hold up a couple of signs. So candidates, you'll see a 30 minute, 30 second warning and then a 10 second warning and then a stop and there'll be a beep, a buzzer or alarm when your time is up. Awesome, thank you, Penny. And thank you candidates for honoring our time commitment. After each group of candidates has um, answered their two questions, we are going to um, have a small amount of time devoted to questions submitted by the audience. So if you look down at the bottom of the screen, there'll be a Q&A. And all you have to do is click on that um, and write your question in. And one of us will pick up on that question and ask the candidates. You can direct that question to any race you want or to a candidate. Um, and that will be basically the gist of our Climate 2020 Forum. I do want to take a quick opportunity to thank our wonderful sponsors. These sponsors are, in order, Interfaith, New Orleans Interfaith Climate Coalition, 
Extension Rebellion, New Orleans, Climate Reality, New Orleans, 350 NOLA, or 350 New Orleans, I lied. Uh, the Alliance for Affordable Energy, Healthy Gulf, Sierra Club, New Orleans, Orleans Audubon, NOLA, Secular Humanist Association, Citizens Climate Lobby, and the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. All right, so let's get started. Peter Digri is going to introduce uh, our speaker, Mr. Edgar Cage. Muted, Peter. You muted. Edgar Cage is one of the top leaders of Together Louisiana. Specifically, he's responsible for legislation. He's on site at the Capitol constantly, uh, knows the ins and the outs, and is always fighting for a just Louisiana. He's going to talk to us about what is probably the second most important vote that you're going to be casting this year. So, Mr. Edgar Cage. Okay, thank you, Peter. On November 3rd, Louisiana voters will vote on whether to amend the state constitution to create a new corporate tax exemption loophole for industries. Now, if could change the slide, Peter. This is what voters will see on the ballot. Do you support an amendment to authorize local governments to enter into cooperative endeavor ad valorem tax exemptions with new or expanding manufacturing establishments for payments in lieu of taxes? Some stories only make sense in the context. So we're going to start by giving the context of how this amendment came about. It is important to understand what the amendment would do. And that's why we think it's really a big deal. One of the most important things to happen in Louisiana in recent years is citizens have started winning against states' gigantic corporate tax subsidies and loopholes. In 2019, St. Bernard teachers closed loopholes on the Chalmette refinery. They claim $4 million in school revenue. In 2019, local officials in St. John the Baptist regain control over these exemptions from the State Board of Commerce and Industry. Residents organized and the school board and parish council rejected Marathon's exemptions for the first time. St. John's property tax revenue will increase next year from $57 million to $100 million, an increase of more than $40 million in a single year. So that's the context for Amendment 5. Now, citizens are closing the largest corporate tax loopholes in the history of Louisiana. So industry set out to create a new loophole, and that is Amendment 5. Here are seven things to know about Amendment 5. Number one, where it, it came from. Amendment 5 came from the most valuable property in Louisiana, a liquid natural gas exporting facility in Cameron Parish. It's called Cameron LNG but it's mostly owned by Japanese investors and it's worth about $12 billion. Last year, Cameron LNG paid $38,000 in property taxes on its $12 billion property. Mm -hmm. Cameron LNG exemptions are about to expire, which means Cameron LNG will start owing about 200 million in property taxes per year. So Cameron LNG tried to enter into what they call a cooperative endeavor agreement under which instead of paying 200 million, they would pay 4 million. The courts declared that constitutional, unconstitutional. That was February 2017. One month later, Cameron lobbyists went into overdrive to amend the constitution to create a new tax loophole and make it make its illegal deal legal. That's the origin of Amendment Number Five. The second thing to know about Amendment Five is that it only won legislative approval because of citizens were at a stay at home order. In 2017, in 2018, and 2019, citizens defeated bills identical to what became Amendment 5. Then in May 2020, 
citizens went under a stay at home order for COVID and industry lobbyists went into overdrive and got it passed because citizens were not present to push back. The third thing to know about Amendment 5 is what it would do. Amendment 5 would allow major corporations to negotiate what they pay in property taxes, whether they pay them at all. It would let one group of taxpayers, industrial manufacturers, have a different set of rules for taxes than anyone else. Instead of paying the tax rate approved by voters, they would be able to pay whatever amount they're able to negotiate through special agreements called cooperative endeavor agreements. Amendment 5 would create one set of rules for industrial corporations and another set of rules for everyone else. The fourth thing to know about Amendment 5, it has no guardrails or restrictions on what tax exemptions could be approved for industrial corporations. Corporations would not be required to create any jobs to get tax exemptions. Exemptions could go to businesses that are actively laying off their workforce. There'd be no restrictions for polluters or dirty industry. But the most incredible of all points is, is number five, about a member five is number five, puts no time limits on the duration of its corporate endeavor agreements. That means a corporation could be exempted from taxation for 25 years, 50 years, or even 100 years. A piece of legislation that accompanies the bill allows exemptions up to 25 years, which is as long as eight terms of office for the average local elected official. Think about it what the lack of any time limits would permit. All a major corporation would have to do is win a single one election cycle, get a deal to pay no taxes, and that arrangement will be binding on all future elected officials and taxing bodies. The sixth thing to know is that in Amendment 5, every household and businesses and 99% of business would pay higher property taxes. Why? Because one group got a special deal and the others didn't. Anytime taxes are reduced for one group, that means that everybody else will pay a, a high percentage. Finally, the seventh thing you know about Amendment 5, it will defund our schools, roads, and other public services. Our teachers are the most underpaid in the nation. Our roads are torn to pieces. Our water systems are barely holding on. Our bridges are falling apart. We know how things got this way. Throughout the last century, while powerful special interests were carving Louisiana's tax code into Swiss cheese with loopholes and inside deals, citizens weren't paying attention. We're paying attention now. On November 3rd, informed citizens across this state can show that we're paying attention now by voting against amendment number five. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you, Peter. Now, um, now we are going to hear from the candidates who are running for the Louisiana Public Service Commission, something a lot of people don't know about, but has a significant amount of power, especially as it relates to energy in the state of Louisiana. Angel Bradford will introduce the candidates and moderate the session. Angel? Thank you. Thank you to our candidates and audience for participating. We will now begin the section for candidates for Louisiana Public Service Commission, District 1. We invited all qualifying applicants, those who accepted are here, and who I have as present are as follows, William Bortfield Jr. Green Party, Alan Bourne Jr. Democrat, J. Kevin Pearson Republican. So three out of six, I believe. Please note that all accepting candidates were given a questionnaire. Their written answers can be found on the website for this event. The verbal questions were chosen from the written questions. Audience, you may submit your questions through the question and answer function. We will allow each candidate one and a half minutes each for their opening statements and answers to each of the two questions we prepared for them. For each round, the order of candidates is alphabetical. Please concentrate your answers towards climate issues in Louisiana. Candidates, please mute yourself when not speaking and unmute when you are speaking. First, we will do opening statements. Mr. William Bortfield Jr., you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Thank you for having me today. 
Uh, my name is William Borkfield, and I am running for Public Service Commission in uh, the Public Service Commissioner spot in District 1. I'm currently a student at UNO studying po political science and pre-law. Uh, aside from that, I'm a marketing assistant at a local law firm in New Orleans. Uh, although the who is important, the why is also equally important. I believe, and my reason for running mainly, is that any commissioner who takes any amount of money from any utility company that they regulate is unfit for office due to conflict of interest. Uh, what we've seen is this district has been robbed of an independent commissioner since 2008, and it's time that we start to phase out unethical behavior in the state government, and we have to do this one part at a time, one office at a time. Uh, I'm just trying to put, do my part and try to create a better Louisiana for everybody going forward. We know that Currently, we see a climate crisis uh, occurring. Uh, we see hurricanes, our hur most active hurricane season we've had on record. Uh, we need to take a stand and move towards green and clean, efficient energy that will not harm our environment further than we already have. And we need to start healing the process that we've uh, caused Thank you, Mr. William Bordfield. Mr. Alan Bourne, Jr., you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to the forum to discuss my views on renewable energy. My name is Alan Bourne, and I am the only Democratic candidate for the Public Service Commission for District 1. I will advocate for the democratic values of equality, transparency, and fundamental fairness on the PSC. I founded Bourne Law Firm in 1985 and have been fighting for the rights of my clients for the past 35 years. I, I participate in the New Orleans Pro Bono Project and the Louisiana Bar Foundation Committee for Legal Services. I am running for the Public Service Commission to be an advocate for the hardworking families of Louisiana. On the commission, I will fight for affordable, reliable, and sustainable utilities for the consumer. Climate change is no hoax and we are at a critical point to change the course of global warming. Just look at the wildfires in California or the hurricane that is heading for us tonight to appreciate the reality of this situation. As PSC commissioner, I will guide the utility companies toward renewable energy alternatives. As power plants age out, we have an opportunity to build new plants that run on renewable energy. I am a commissioner who will not be beholden to the utility companies I regulate. It is time to put people ahead of profits. Thank you, Mr. Alan Bourne. Mr. J. Kevin Pearson, you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Thank you. And uh, you can drop the J. I generally go by Kevin. But, uh, anyway, uh, I would like to thank all of you for holding this forum and thank the candidates who participated. I am a Republican. I've been a Republican all my life. Um, I've been in the legislature. I was in the legislature from 2008 to 2020, actually the first part of this year. And I always try to do things for the people. I mean, that's what you're sent up there for. And I passed legislation. I chaired the retirement committee trying to save the state you know, many dollars and try and do what's right. Make sure that the teachers are, and, and state employees are insured their pension. But I'll go ahead and move off of that a little bit. But I work to like to, you know, look at my record. Anybody can look at my record and would probably say that he was there for the people. That's why I ran. I want to make my state better. And maybe I am a little bit unique in this, uh, not unique from one perspective. Mr. Bordfield said that he will not take money from the uh, companies he regulates. And I made that pledge as well. And perhaps Mr. Warren, uh, welcome all of them and encourage all of them to do well. I'm not taking contributions. I do see issues. My daughter just bought a house in Panama City Beach on the water and it's concerning. I was affected by Katrina. We do need to look at alternatives and solutions and not 30, uh, 50 year build any 50 year plants with natural gas. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. And thank you candidates for your opening statements. Now we'll ask our first question. 
Will you put forth a Louisiana statewide RPS, which means renewable portfolio standard? And if so, what will be your timeline to 100% renewable energy, bearing in mind that in the Paris Accord, quote, the United States committed to cutting overall greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. Mr. Bortfield, you have one and a half minutes to answer. Well, there's so many factors that go into it. The first thing is you're just one vote on a five person uh, commission. So the biggest part is advocating and working with your fellow commissioners to get these things passed. Um, the, the second thing is there's so much that the state, I can feel the state can do without federal funding or federal help. And then at a certain point, we do need help from the federal government to uh, sort of help fund for small businesses and for residents uh, in the state. The, the biggest thing is that I want to shoot for 2045, 2050, 100% clean energy. Uh, I would like that to be a late estimate by my standards. I just wanna be on the conservative side um, because I just, I, I, there's so much work that needs to go in. There's, you're, you're just one vote on a five person board, but uh, I do believe that we need to get to 100% renewable energy as soon as possible. Uh, one way we can do this is by deregulating uh, the market. This is a quick fix. Uh, now, not in the sense that California did in the early 2000s. We can do it at a more regulated stance where we don't have private companies going in and out of business and nobody to operate the plants. But we do need to do these things to help bring in, uh, I believe, green energy. And it'll be better for the consumer. It'll be cheaper to produce and provide better jobs in the area. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Boyfield. Mr. Bourne, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. All right. Will you put forth a Louisiana statewide RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard? And if so, what will be your timeline to 100% renewable energy, bearing in mind that in the Paris Accord, the United States committed to cutting overall greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28%, below 2005 levels by 2025. You'll have one and a half minutes to answer. Okay. We are at a critical point with global warming. The present administration has done all it can to reverse uh, the, the legislation, the protections, as well as the Paris Accord to, uh, to get on our way to, to reducing the greenhouse emissions in accordance with the Paris Accord. We are at a cross, crossroads. We see the hurricanes, the wildfires, there's evidence of this all over. So we need to get started now. So yes, I would definitely support an RPS. Um, I would support it. We have to transition. We're, we're, it's not something that's easy, it's, but we have to transition towards renewable energy. Uh, the technology and the cost of renewable energy has come way down in the last few years where it becomes economical and, and cost effective for consumers to have these type of powers. On the commission, I will guide the utility companies toward renewables uh, as these power plants age out that are made from coal and natural gas. I would strongly urge the, these companies to come back with, with um, renewable energy, solar, wind, uh, and the like. So yes, I, I am a, a, an advocate. I would like to get back into the Paris Accord. Hopefully Joe Biden wins and we can get on our way with this. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. Mr. Pearson, would you like me to repeat the question? I think I'm good with that, with the question. All right. All right. Uh, one thing that I was going to say is I think the uh, the goal of 2050, uh, I know we talk about 2025, but the way things have gone, I think that's a little bit of a optimistic goal now, but it's certainly something that I think we can migrate towards. Our, for example, I, I've spoken with one of our uh, cooperatives, our electric cooperatives. They have a new contract coming up in 2024 and I asked them what, what they're looking at and what they expect to get. They came along and said, it's like, there's a ton of solar out there. There's a lot of solar that they'll be able to use. 
and the solar that will be out there, they actually think that it'll lower the rates. And I absolutely am a strong believer of believing that as technology advances further and further, we're going to be able to, it's just going to be much more cost effective. As far as a, a, a port renewable portfolio standard, I'm not sure if, uh, certainly I would uh, be glad to come up with something towards that. But as far as that, I, I, I think that is something that is led by the governor and perhaps the legislature. But I do see companies that are migrating. I, and, and look, the, the, the uh, net, the metering issue that the Public Service Commission did, what, a year ago, I think it was something that was just absolutely atrocious. They're okay for uh, power for the utility companies to be green, which they've done, but certainly not the individuals. So, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Pearson. All right, I will now ask our second question. What is your policy on accepting money from any of the utilities that the LPSC regulates? How will you remain impartial to these utilities? So it's a two-part question. Um, Mr. Bortfeld, you have one and a half minutes to answer. Well, this uh, might be a fairly short, but I can dive into it a little bit more. Uh, I pledge not to take any money from any of the companies that I regulate as commissioner. Uh, and I actively don't take money from any of those companies right now. Uh, I actually believe that we need to move towards making it illegal, not just unethical. Uh, it really is a crime when somebody can hold a fundraiser for a private phone company uh, that does the prison rates in the state. And the reason that they get out of the ethical investigation is because uh, they're not the ones directly negotiating the contract. However, they're still the elected official for the office that's regulating those private prison phone calls. When you look at that, that should be plain outright illegal, not just something that people go and look, eh, maybe, well. So when we look at how can we stay impartial, it's just simple, we just don't take the money. We make it illegal. We, and that would be, you know, if we can't do it as the commission, as a five person commission board, well, then we take it to the legislature and we have them write it into a constitutional amendment to be put up onto the uh, vote, you know, for a general election. Uh, other than that, it's just simple. You don't take money from the companies you regulate. You wouldn't try to bribe a food health inspector if they inspected your restaurant. You'd go to jail for that. Thank you, Mr. Bortfield. Mr. Bourne, you have one and a half minutes to answer. I believe allowing the utility companies to give contributions to the um, commissioners is unfair and that it should be stopped. Our sister states of Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia have legislatively said that it's illegal for utility companies to, to give uh, contributions to the regulators that regulate them. And that makes a whole lot of sense. And in time and history, we'll wonder what took us so long to come to that. But I would strongly support, and this is a legislative move that, that uh, would need to be done. It's not something that the Public Service Commission controls. Um, the, these utility companies like incumbents. They, they know what they get. They, they give them a lot of money to, to do campaigns. So it makes it hard and difficult for person's trying to get on the commission and going against an incumbent because they're bankrolled by the utilities. So I have not taken any money from the utilities. I don't plan to. And um, I just, I believe that it, it should not be done. Uh, I, I believe that uh, on the other hand, we need to work with the utilities because they're, they offer us valuable services and we need to steer them. They're in it for the profit. We need to make utilities uh, give them incentive to go green and to, to keep rates low by make, make, giving them a profit incentive. So uh, that's my answer. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. Mr. Pearson? Hey, we're three for three on this one. I did uh, initially, I haven't taken any contributions from the companies that we regulate and I have vowed not to take contributions if elected from many of the companies that we regulate. And I do think, I do believe 
look, as being in the legislature, I'm not trying to make a big deal of that, but you, you could see it. You could see many instances where people would be uh, maybe always keeping that in the back of their mind. It doesn't have to be a constitutional amendment. It could be a bill. I'll tell you what, in my 12 years in the legislature, I, I never saw a public service commissioner up there, but you bring a bill that does that, and I guarantee you some of them will be up there. But I would be supporting getting rid of, uh, I agree, I agree with both. It, it's, there is too much money. For example, they give, uh, AT&T just for example, I believe they're $42,000 to the incumbent. $42,000, do you think they do that for nothing? I mean, really, anybody has to be very naive. Whereas your typical legislature over the same time frame might have received five hundred dollars over that time frame. Not really going to have a lot of effect on them for that. But once you start looking at the forty thousand, the thirty thousand, and that's not even including the individual contributions from employees of the companies. So, in short answer, won't take the money from any of the companies we regulate, and that's I think something that we should migrate towards for the commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you candidates for your answers. That concludes this part of our forum. Thank you so much, uh, all you candidates and thank you, Angel. And I wanna thank all the candidates at, in advance for keeping to the time limit. I know it's kind of hard to do and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Next um, group of candidates we're going to hear from are those who are running for Congressional Districts 1, 2, and 6. Pooja Prazid will be the moderator for this section of our debate. Pooja. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pooja Prazid. Welcome to Climate Forum 2020. First of all, thank you to all our candidates and audience for participating. We will now begin the section for candidates for Louisiana U.S. Representative District 1. Uh, Steve Scalisi is the incumbent. We invited all the qualifying applicants. Those who accepted are here. Please note that all accepting candidates were given a questionnaire. Their written answers can be found on the website for this event. The verbal questions were chosen from the written questions. Uh, as a reminder, audience, you may submit questions through the Q&A function. For all candidates, we will allow each candidate one and a half minutes for each opening statement and answers to each of the two questions. Uh, please concentrate your answers towards climate issues in Louisiana. And candidates, please mute yourself when not speaking and unmute when speaking. We will first start with the opening statements. Ms. Lee, Ms. Lee and Dugas, uh, of the Democratic Party, you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, our most important, we're in a crisis in general in many fields, but I'm here to talk about the current climate change crisis. Here we are, we're all getting ready for a storm, number six. Uh, it's never been this busy before. We've never been into the Delta and the rest of the other alphabet before, but we are now. California fires are just burning and we gotta, it's time to stop it. And we have to work together to stop it. We have to get the companies, we have to uh, rework the regulations have to get away from the coal. And there's a lot of ways that we can turn on by water, um, water, wind, solar. We have enough space that we can have humongous farms that we could function and, you know, power the whole state. So I look forward to answering your questions. Thank y'all. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Howard Kearney, um, who is part of the Libertarian Party, you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, having me on. 
Um, I am um, the representative candidate for U.S. Con Congressional District 1, and um, I look forward to questions. Um, that will be my opening statement. Okay, uh, now I will ask our first question. Uh, would you advocate for or vote to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord? Why or why not? Uh, Ms. Leanne Dugas, could you go first, please? You have one and a half minutes to answer the question. Sure. Yes, I think it's very important that we rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, we should have never got out of it. Um, climate change is a worldwide problem. We're part of a global community. A lot of people don't want to admit that, but we are. We're part of a global community. And only by working together can we save our Earth. This is the only Earth we have. And definitely we need to be back into it. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr. Kearney, would you like to go next? Uh, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I, I, I've got the, uh, I've got it, thank you. Uh, no, I, uh, and if you don't mind, I'll just read from what I wrote uh, here just to uh, uh, make it sound more uh, <laughs> coherent than my babbling. Uh, no, I would not vote to rejoin the uh, Paris Climate Accord. Uh, first of all, man-made climate change is not real. Second, highly cost, it is highly costly in terms of jobs and would do uh, close to nothing to address the supposed climate change. Third, waste taxpayer money by paying into the Green Climate Fund that would cost $100 billion per year. The fourth reason is whether it is conventional fuel companies or renewable ones, the best way for American energy companies to be competitive is to be innovative and competitive in the marketplace, not build their business models around international agreements. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your answer. Moving on to the next question. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about HR 5986, Environmental Justice for All Act. Uh, this resolution does many things, including the consideration of cumulative impacts in air and water permitting decisions, program funding to study harmful products marketed towards women and girls, and funds for environmental justice work and a just transition. Do you support this? Why or why not? Uh, Ms. Dugas, uh, you have one and a half minutes to answer that. Thank you. Yes, I do support it. We do not realize um, being in the medical field, there's a lot of things more than just viruses and bugs and everything that affects human beings, that affects us. As somebody growing up in Louisiana, we all have allergies in our environment mold, ragweed, trees, you name it, we got allergies. And that really affects the, how we feel on a daily basis and how we function. And the carelessness that some companies are taking with our environment, it, it just don't make sense. They realize, they don't realize that this is all we have. And if we don't save it and work to save it, we're gonna be walking around every day with masks on. Is that what we wanna do? Do we want our kids having masks and being confined into clear rooms and not being able to go out and enjoy the sun and play in the sand and no, you know? So we gotta really take it seriously. And that's what I'm here to do because it's important. The world is important. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr. Kearney, uh, you have one and a half minutes. Would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no, thank you. Um, I did spend uh, quite a bit of time looking up this um, uh, 5986 and trying to figure it out and looking at all the back, uh, background on it. Um, so after I've studied it for a bit, uh, my answer is no, um, because it would give too much power to the federal government. This issue needs to be at the local government. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, thank you for your answer. And thank you to the candidates of uh, US District 1. Uh, for now, uh, we will be moving on to uh, US Representative District 2. Sorry, um, I was on mute. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so we're moving on to Louisiana U.S. Representative District 2. Uh, we will start with the opening statements. Uh, is Mr. Batiste here? Sorry, I do not believe we have either candidate for District 2. We have Mr. Belden Batiste. Um, who will be for the next section, I believe. Oh, is that? Oh, Belden is District 2. Oh, okay. All right. Um, we had a request to allow, um, allow him to speak from his cell phone, and I, so I'm going to allow him to speak. Go ahead and, um, and speak, please. Opening statement. Oh, Mr. Batiste, you have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Go ahead. He's still muted. Unmute. I cannot appear to unmute him. Um, Try star six, that might do it. Oh, there you go, Mr. Cage. M Mr. Batiste, if you can um, star six on your phone, if you, you've called in and I've, I've enabled your... Um... Okay, he's trying to call in right now. Okay. So you might have to let someone else go first and then he'll be... There he is. There he is. Okay. You see him? Um, is he 504-508-3284? He's the only phone in that we have. I'm sorry, it says Belden Batiste, that's him. Yep, that's actually you. Um, I have unmuted both you and the phone, the only phone number who's called in. So I may need to try and work with you guys um, while we move to a different candidate. Um, try again, uh, Mr. Batiste, one more, um, was it star six? Trying to get you to log in now. Can you get in? Uh -uh. They need a. They're trying to do your opening statement. There we go. I can hear you. Can you just give your opening statement? What you mean? Just give your opening statement. All right. I, I did... Just go ahead and talk. They can hear you. Hi, my name is Belden Baptiste. I'm running for the second congressional district. The reason why I'm running because. The uh, guy that's in this, this congressman, Cedric Richard, and he accepts money from chemical plants, big um, for oil companies, big, big um, corporations, and on the issue of climate change, um, he he votes against it every time. So I'm in there, and what one of the things I want to say, I will not accept money from organizations that harm our environment or community in any kind of way. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Um, I believe Mr. James is not on here. So in that case, I will move on to the question portion. 
Uh, Mr. Batiste, uh, the first question is the Green New Deal and the Thrive Agenda include provisions for equitable and clean job creation and training, transitioning to smart distributed energy grids, upgrading slash building energy efficient buildings, overhauling transportation, working with farmers to eliminate, eliminate GHGs and pollution in agriculture, and accelerating clean manufacturing. Which aspects do you support and which do you not support? You will have one and a half minutes to answer the question. Mr. Batiste, you're on mute, I believe. Wait, I'm sorry, I had you muted. You gotta start over, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. The, the green, I support the green deal 100% because the green deal can bring jobs. People need jobs, but we got to make sure the green deal is safe and for us dealing with com um, carbon monoxide and other poison gases and things that are bringing home. But I support it 100%. But I want to make sure when the green deal happens that the money go where they're saying the money's going to go for us, the jobs and electric electricity and everything, because we know in the past the money's haven't got down there, you know. And just like the guy that I said now, Cedric Richmond, he's against all that, you know. But I can tell you I will fight and support the Green Deal, and I will get with groups and hear their opinions on it. And the groups that support the Green Deal, I want to hear what they got to say, and I'll get with the experts and different people. And if the Green Deal is good for people, I, I support it 100%, but it's got to be good for people and making sure that it don't harm the environment. Thank you for your answer. Moving on to the second question. Uh, District 2 contains the Waterford nuclear plant. Do you support nuclear energy as a fuel source? Why or why not? You will have one and a half minutes to answer the question. Wait, I didn't hear you because you know we have a te technical difficulty. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, District 2 contains the Waterford nuclear plant. Do you support nuclear energy as a fuel source? Why or why not? Yes, I support nuclear energy because I think I think it'll be good for us, for the community and the people. Now, if if the nuclear energy is not safe for the people when I get if I get in Washington DC I'm going to deal with groups that know about it and deal with people that know about it so if I'm saying yes I support it but if it's something I'm missing like something I don't know about the nuclear plants after I talk to the groups and the groups that think it's safe that's who I'm gonna be with I'm gonna always do the things that's best for the people in the community Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Um, now we will be moving on to uh, US Representative District 6. Uh, those who accepted are here. Uh, the two candidates present are. Okay, Noonie. So we finish? Or well, do I we don't know, we gotta now? wait and see. Yes, hi, Mr. Batiste. Yes, uh, we are finished with your portion and now we are moving on to District 6. Uh, we appreciate your answers. And uh, now uh, we will start with the opening statements. Uh, Mr. Torregano, uh, with, who isn't with any party, you will have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Oh, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Well, my name is Richard Targano. I'm running for the 6th Congressional District in Louisiana. Uh, my ballot number is 44 and my website is rpt501.com. Uh, if you want more information about me, uh, 
you, you, I'd like you to visit my website. And I guess the question is, uh, why am I running? It's no different from if I was to uh, go to college, go to church, join the military. It's something that's important. It's something I wanted to do. Uh, Kennedy, a while back, asked what we could do for our country. And one of the things we need to do is run for political office. It has to be the epitome of living in a representative democracy is to run for office. I have a good platform. I have uh, my heart and, and head is in the right place. And uh, I think the middle class needs someone representing them because I think they're underrepresented. The Democrats of special interest groups and identity politics, uh, the Republicans have a <laughs> large, uh, big business, big money. And so it kind of leaves the middle class out. Uh, and my campaign slogan is the status quo has got to go. And that can be no better example than what happened in the presidential debate. I can't believe that the Republican Democrats couldn't put up two better candidates than what we've seen on television. To me, they had twiddled D and twiddled them. Both, they had no business. The two oldest presidents in the world are, are two oldest presidents ever to run for, Cong uh, for president. And they put them up. Uh, that's got to be a better way. That's why I'm an independent. Thank you. Time's up. Okay. Thank you for your answer. And now we will move on to Mr. Williams, who is a Democrat. Uh, you have one and a half minutes to give your opening statement. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And thank you to your co panelists for giving me the opportunity to engage. So my name is D'Artagnan A. Williams, and I'm the candidate for the 6th Congressional District for the state of Louisiana. Amongst all things and above all things, I'm a father first, and um, um, I take pride and joy in being so. I'm a serial entrepreneur by day. I'm the founder, chairman, and CEO of Duck Pond Technologies, Inc., which houses and holds, in fact, owns 10 unique patents in the space of fraud detection, detainment, and determined. I'm also a catalyst for change. And I believe that Louisiana is right. I believe that Louisiana is ripe and ready to take lead um, as a state here in the United States um, with a strong agricultural base and a very dominant presence in the petrochemical industry. And in, and in recognizing that, I'm a catalyst for change as it respects the New Deal, um, the New Green Deal agreement initially. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now we will move on to the question portion. So the first question is on October 16th, 2019, the Department of Energy approved the Plaquemines LNG project in your district. Do you support continued investments and development of LNG facilities, liquid natural gas for export? Uh, Mr. Uh, Torregano, could you please go first? Yes. Yes, I support the LNG project. Uh, brings jobs to Louisiana. And uh, until we convert the help the fossil fuel till we convert to uh, um, uh, fusion and fission power, we're going to need all the natural gas or fracking so that we don't spend our money sending it overseas to a obtain uh, imported oil. So until we have, you know, the development of fusion power and fission power, which I call for a 10 year crash program to develop both. The fission would be uh, 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 thorium uh, molten salt reactors and fusion technology, uh, which uh, we, we don't really have a viable fusion technology program, but we need to have it started. That's why I'm calling for a crash program in 10 years. Um, so yeah, I would support the LNG fracking until we had viable fusion and fission technology. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now moving on to Mr. Williams, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no ma'am, I think I got it. Okay, you have one and a half minutes. Sure, sure. So I, I do support the continued investments 
and development to the extent that they provide jobs and economic opportunities for these communities. However, we also know that these fossil fuels uh, facilities raise a plethora of health and environmental concerns that may have irreversible um, effects. The LNG industry is being marketed as a safe option, but these statements are substantiated and for these reasons, um, I cannot fully support the expansion of these facilities beyond the bare minimum um, usage needed to compete in a sustainable society. The oil and gas industry has recently taken a hit uh, from the pandemic and was already in a longer term decline as fossil fuels um, began to uh, become less profitable while um, the world transitions to a green economy. Um, since District 6 covers part of that Southeast Louisiana coast, which includes many offshore oil rigs and gas, um, ships and vessels and onshore petrochemical refineries and LG export facilities. Um, so in that light, in that regard, I would not support expansion, um, but I do support the, 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 the simultaneous, if you will, invest, continuous and constant investment of new job growth and opportunities with regard and introduction to green, the, the new Green Deal technology that is um, more spurging and progressive than not. Thank you for your answer. Now we will move on to our second question. Have you accepted contributions or donations from any fossil fuel, energy, plastics, petrochemical, utility, or special interest PACs? And will you commit against accepting such contributions? Uh, Mr. Torregano, uh, to I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, Mr. Torregano, can you, could you, Mr. Torregano, well, you will have one and a half well, minutes. Okay. Sorry, you will have one and a half minutes to answer the question. Uh, please go ahead. Um, could, could you repeat the, the question again? Yeah. Have you accepted contributions? Oh, okay. Right. No, I haven't accepted contributions and wouldn't accept contributions for anyone or any pack. I think that goes without saying. I got that listed on my website. Uh, as a member of Congress, they're paying me to do a certain job. I don't need any more money. I do what I, you know, I have to do without accepting money from anyone else. Uh, that's not going to sway my decision one way or the other, but I would not accept any type of PAC money. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Mr. Williams, we will go to you next. Um, you will have one and a half minutes to answer the question. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, yes, ma'am, please and thank you. Uh, have you accepted contributions or donations from any fossil fuel, energy, plastics, petrochemical, utility, or special interest PACs? Will you commit against accepting such contributions? Um, so the short answer is no and yes. But I will remind um, your viewers that the incumbent, Gary Graves, has accepted 99% um, of his war chest from petrochemical companies and the like. Um, my campaign is being funded and fueled by voters, um, constituents with whom I readily identify, who understand what stress, strain, and struggle looks like, and who are not as disconnected, if you will, from the everyday lives that we experience here down on the ground level. Um, to the contrary, the incumbent has, in fact, taken in each and every dollar of his war chest um, um, and by the tune of less than 1% um, from Big Petro. And I wanted to offer that remark so as to draw a stark contrast in between what a people's campaign look like and what a big corporation campaign looks like as it appreciates fossil fuels um, by comparison and contrast to the Green New Deal. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates for their answers. Um, now I will be handing it back to Claire to introduce the next segment. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you candidates, we appreciate that. And thank you, Pooja. Uh, the next and the last, the final group of candidates will be the candidates that are running for United States Senate. Deron Joyner will be our moderator for this section. Duran.
Um, unmute yourself. Can everyone hear me? A little bit louder. Can everybody hear me? A little louder. Oh, one second. Hi, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to Climate Forum 2020. I'm Deron Joyner. Thank you to our candidates and audience members for participating. We will now begin the section of candidates for Louisiana U.S. Senate. Dr. Bill Cassidy is the incumbent in this race. We've invited all qualifying applicants. Those who have accepted are here. First, we will start with opening statements. Applicants will have one and one half minutes for opening statements, and we will then move on to our two questions. We want to remind all candidates to mute themselves when they are not speaking. Your barrel billiard, no party. Uh, you are up first. Um, uh, thank you all panel for having us here tonight. It's a great opportunity under this COVID uh, pandemic to be able to at least reach reach some people and, and get out, have our messages heard. Uh, you know, we are in a crisis in our country for on many different levels. And, you know, people always ask me, why, why am I running for office? And, and, and the short answer is in 1985, as a senior in high school, I, I stood up and I made a commitment and I took an oath to defend the United States and the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I served in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I did honorably then, and I look to serve again in a different capacity and, and following and to protect my fellow man uh, against the challenges that we face today. Uh, you know, in, in light of all that's happening in our country, I'm involved in this race because it's more important now than in any time of our lives to, to be involved in our, our political uh, races, but it's time we put our political party affiliation aside and do what's best for America, do what's best for our climate and do what's best for all the people. And it's being proven every day that uh, we need to work together and compromise and come back into the spirit of compromise instead of the spirit of competition and work to come to a mutually uh, beneficial future for that's sustainable for all of its citizens. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Billy. Is Mr. John Paul Borges present? Okay. Is Mr. Alexander John present? Okay, we'll move on to Mr. MV Vinny Mendoza, Independent Party. You'll have one and one half minutes to give your opening statement. Hi. Um my name is Vinny Mendoza. Um, in Louisiana, we have a, a, an environmental emergency that affects the health of our children, local communities, and this entire state. Our air, water, soil, all of them are contaminated, whether it's city water or well water. All the lakes, rivers, canals are contaminated. And Cancer Alley is a prime example of air pollution, which has about a, a 100 mile um, radius reach. For this reason, I'm involved in, in creating a um, agrarian reform as part of the Green uh, New Deal. And with the agrarian reform, uh, I plan to provide uh, food security and, and shelter for millions of Americans and increase the current um, agricultural uh, GDP from 1% to 20%, um, create uh, 25 million new smart farms, uh, create um, uh, a hydropower plant that can pro uh, produce 1500 megawatts, which will provide enough energy for 100, uh, 1 million homes. So, I think this is what, what we need to, to create uh, solutions, not just uh, dwell on, on the problems. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Mr. Antoine Pierce, Democratic Party, you have one and one half minute. Mm. Is he not present? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. 
Okay, great. Uh, my name is Antoine Pierce. Uh, I am number 12 on your ballot. I am running against Bill Cassidy uh, as a Democrat. Um, of course, I am a staunch supporter of the Green New Deal, um, especially the, the, the revised version that's uh, specific to the South. Um, this has been something that we have championed for a long time now, uh, specifically um, the, the interest of, get, of cleaning up our air and water, moving to renewable energy, um, trying to be competitive with our neighbors to the West in Texas who are leading the country in wind power, um, creating millions of jobs here in Louisiana. Um, this is something that we can do if we have the political will to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I grew up here in Baton Rouge where we house one of the um, largest refineries uh, in the country. And I've seen the impact that this can have on our environment. So a lot of us t speak in terms of, um, of Cancer Alley, but there, we're, there's uh, environmental injustice all across the state and we can address it um, with the right measures. We can address it with the political will. And that's what I am bringing to United States Senate, a plan to address environmental justice, particularly uh, in, the, in the minority communities that are being most adversely impacted by, uh, by climate change and by um, the pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. And now we'll hear from the surrogate for Adrian Perkins. You have one and one half minutes for your opening statement. Hi there, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, so I'm not Adrian Perkins. Uh, he is mayor of Shreveport and he's very glad you're having this discussion tonight. I'm very sorry he couldn't join. Uh, he's heading to an event in Homa and uh, our political director, Kia Bickham had another engagement in Baton Rouge. Um, you know, with another hurricane in the forecast for this week, these are critical issues to talk about tonight, tomorrow, and every day. Um, I hope you'll get a chance to see him at an event soon. He can speak much more eloquently about these issues than I can for him. Uh, the campaign's motto is people before politics, putting Louisiana first. It's a people power movement supported by thousands of working people all over Louisiana and all across the country who want to support folks in Louisiana. Since he joined the race in J July, we've received over 4,000 donations from folks in Louisiana, including 60 out of 64 parishes. The average online donation is $36. And the most common profession is people who are educators and retirees. Um, it's the most individual donations in the first 100 days of a Senate campaign in Louisiana history. You can go to PerkinsForLA.com to learn more about his story. Uh, very simply, um, he joined the Army after 9-11 because he saw the look of fear in his teacher's faces, served in two wars, back to Harvard Law School and then turned down big city job offers to return home and run for mayor of Shreveport. In his first year, he balanced the budget, brought crime to a 45 year low. Just today, we learned about the latest injustice that the Washington Senate has uh, failed to get accomplished. Um, you can go to twitter.com and see his video there from a couple hours ago and see how he feels. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we're here, here from Mr. Peter Winstrup of the Democratic Party. You'll have one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Joyner, and thank you everyone for holding this event tonight. Uh, we have an enormous challenge in front of us in preparing uh, the climate for tomorrow. Uh, I come to this campaign as a husband, as a father of hope and grace, as a teacher, working with young people, both as a father and a teacher. Uh, I've put an immense energy and time into the development of our young people, and I'm committed to making sure that they have a clean and green environment uh, for their future. Uh, and, and, and education is one of the most important issues at the heart of every challenge facing this state, but this campaign is not just about education. Early in my career, I learned from older teachers the difference between serving and empower. Serving, giving things to students, telling them what to do, and empowering, giving them tools and trust to find solutions, to be the agent of their own change. And that's what this campaign is about. And we've seen the need for that in the last year. We've saw, seen this presidential administration gut EPA protections um, in the midst of a respiratory crisis. And at the, on the other end, I've stood with Sharon Levine and folks at Rise St. James at the YCI water permitting meeting, standing with folks who are fighting for a better environment. So I'm committed to solutions that empower people with local data about pollutions, empower people with the private right of action uh, to sue for environmental harm and empower local governments 
with access to a national green bank to invest in changes that will make a more sustainable future. Thank you, Mr. Winstrom. We will now move on to asking our first question. A 2017 study by the International Monetary Fund covered in Forbes showed that the United States subsidized the fossil fuel industry $649 billion annually. This is 10 times more than we spend on education. Do you support such subsidies? If not, what will you do to reduce them? Mr. Billet, you're up first with one and a half minutes to answer. No, I, I do not support government subsidies to any industrial markets. Uh, the government spending that we have all over on all different fronts is way too much. It's, we have heavy spending. We're trying to buy people's favor and bribe a constituency with their own monies, and we're putting it in the wrong place. Uh, we have to work to a budget balance, uh, balanced budget amendment, and in, in order to to cut the government spending and to eliminate their ability to just frivolously uh, spend money. And especially in entering into uh, industrial markets that the government is not in the business of, uh, of running industry. It's, it regulates and it, it, it puts out different policies and procedures that they have to follow to kind of shape their decision-making. But as far as to give, uh, to give subsidies or to, to give financial aid to industries because they're too big to fail or all this stuff. We're in a free enterprise capitalist society. And when you start intervening into that operation as a government, you, you disrupt the entire process. And we see that all over the nation right now with this mix of socialism and democracy and capitalism and free enterprise. And uh, it's, it's not a good practice to be in. We need to allow businesses to operate. And as a government, we need to put regulations in place to protect the people and hold those businesses accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Billiot. Mr. Mendoza, would you like me to repeat the question? I got it, thanks. Um, okay. I'm opposed to subsidizing the fossil uh, industry and also the agricultural industry. Why should we pay people millions of dollars not to produce? It's crazy. I was the uh, assistant to the Inspector General of the Air Force and I saw a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse, particularly in the area of uh, world profiteering. And I believe that if we can only re reinvest 10% of the national defense uh, budget every year and invest it in the Green New Deal, uh, just with that alone, we can create 50 million new jobs. And we can create, uh, everything can be for uh, clean energy, uh, to, uh, 25 million new the smart farms. A hundred years ago, uh, the GDP uh, for agriculture was 80% and we had uh, 6 million uh, farms uh, taking care of 100 million people. And now we only have 2 million uh, farms taking care of 350 million. So we need to, to uh, reinvest the, the American uh, tax dollars but definitely no subsidies to the fossil uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Mr. Pierce, you're up next. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. A 2007 study showed that the United States subsidized the fossil fuel industry $649 billion annually. Do you support such, such subsidies? If not, what will you do to reduce them? <clears throat> the answer is no. Uh, I do not support the subsidies given to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, if anything, uh, I think what we need to do is be looking at repealing those subsidies and reinvesting those dollars into programs that are going to uh, clean up the communities that they've damaged. As a matter of fact, we need to be looking at carbon taxing uh, those industries as opposed to offering them, in, for lack of better words, welfare. So that's what it is. Uh, we need to be creating a central, a people-centered economy that focuses those subsidies that are given to fossil fuel industries into communities where they're most needed. We know that removing those subsidies will level the playing field um, in, in these communities, uh, cause uh, these industries that are making billions of dollars a year to pay their fair share into these communities, hold them accountable 
uh, to the, the destruction that they're creating. So my, my first thing would be to repeal those subsidies, roll back those subsidies, push for uh, local control, um, but, but more so on the federal level, since we're running for United States Senate, it's to say that we, we cannot allow you to continue to receive those uh, subsidies. And of course, that's going to be something that you have to look at in the tax code. Um, Louisiana's tax code is convoluted um, and, and it's going to take a lot of work to roll those things out of, uh, you know, and a lot of it is a, is a, a very local thing since, uh, you know, those subsidies are awarded on a, on a local level. So, but we have to look at the tax code. We have to look at how we can reinvest those dollars that are given to the fossil fuel industry back into um, the communities uh, where they belong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Perkins Sergit, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. Um, got it. So uh, Washington political games are making us sick. Right now there's too many problems, not enough action because the special interests are getting special favors. Mayor Perkins, I mentioned his video on Twitter about two hours ago, I want you to check it out. Bill Cassidy has taken millions of dollars in campaign money from special interests. Um, you'll see how angry the mayor is that Washington just today said they won't pass a virus relief bill. Now, not a lot of senators know what a wish sandwich is, two slices and you wish something was in the middle. Our campaign won't take a dime of corporate PAC money. And so no, he doesn't support fossil fuels, uh, subsidies for fossil fuels when our families can't put food on the table or find work through no fault of their own. Um, unfortunately, our state's disproportionately impacted by sea level rise and extreme weather like hurricanes and floods. The coastline is losing land, one of the fastest rates in the world. And um, we're sixth in a nation in cancer rates and experts say it may get worse. Mayor Perkins is proud of Louisiana's economy, but he won't stand for polluters um, and reckless conduct. We have a moral responsibility to future generations to solve these problems now, but too many Washington politicians listen to these special interests, not the experts. And they're forcing Louisianans to carry an undue burden because they won't act now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Winstrup, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. Uh, all of us in this room seem united against corporate subsidies and yet they still happen. And the reason is we know Washington and special interests. So to go and then uh, support a candidate like Mayor Perkins, whose strongest base of support is in Wall Street in Washington and hear him talk about subsidies is laughable. I've served my entire career in this state serving young people whose future we're talking about. No, I don't think we should have corporate subsidies. I think the stimulus and the support must go directly to the people. And that's why I have a plan so that whenever the price of oil drops below $60 a barrel, we provide automatic stimulus to put people back to work, capping orphan wells, upgrading our electrical transmission systems so that we can have more than 0.5% solar on the grid, and improving our research centers so that we are not just the leading research centers for petroleum engineering, but also for solar and green energy. Thank you, Mr. Winster. We will now move on to our second question. Do you support the goal of a 100% clean renewable economy by 2050? If so, how would you work with the president, governor, state and local elected officials, as well as state agency leaders to achieve that goal? Mr. Billet, you're up first with one and one half minutes to answer. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. Um, I, I do not support 100% uh, clean renewable economy by 2050 or by any date, simply because as a realist, it's impossible. Uh, we as a consumable society, unless we give up shoes, clothes, any manufactured good, we cannot eliminate our um, all the all the stuff that's being put out into our, we can't eliminate 100% of it unless we go back to horse and buggies and we get away from the way of living. You're not gonna convince the people of the United States of America to go back uh, 2000 years and live that way. So what we need to do is to change the way that we live, change our desire and our dependency upon the, the greenhouse gas emission industries and start working towards a sustainable future. But to understand where we are today in the lifestyles that we live, 
to be a realist and you can wish for anything just like you were saying but to be re to be real it's almost impossible to promise people i'm going to give you a zero emission uh environment in in any amount of years is an impossible feat simply because of the way that we choose to live. And we're not going to convince people to change 100% and to get back to a, uh, a non-industrial society. It's, you cannot go back to that. So uh, I believe that we have to reduce our dependency and we have to move forward, but I can't jump on that bandwagon. Okay, thank you for your answer. Mr. Mendoza, you're up next. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, thanks. Uh, I just like to differ with Mr. Billiard. There's nothing that is impossible. Everything is possible once you set your mind to it. And in this case, we just have to be open-minded and, and do a little more research. We have third world nations that have uh, hydropower that, that is more advanced than, than what we have here in, the, in, in Louisiana. And we just, you know, if you look at the at the uh, rail system, a hundred years ago, we were uh, basically number one in the economy, and we being like regressing, going back in time instead of going forward. So it is possible to to uh, to reach the goal by 2050, and I, I believe they can be done in 10 years, within 10 years. The um, uh, hydropower is the fastest possible way to create energy. And we have solar, wind power, geo, geothermal. So we just have to be open-minded and, and look at the, all the projects that are possible, that they are being already used in, in different countries. So we just need to, to cut the pace and, and, and make it better. But we need to be open-minded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Mr. Pierce? This is absolutely possible. Um, I think the, you have to have the political will and the, you know, I think really a, a, a broader perspective on what can happen. As a matter of fact, 29 of the 50 states have already adopted policies. Um, as a matter of fact, um, there are some that say that they'll reach it by 2045. They've moved it up five years to say they can reach 100% renewable energy. This is absolutely possible. Um, we know that with the right efforts, the right um, planning, there are already measures in place to begin to move us in that direction. Again, it takes the political will. The reason why we haven't seen this already, we certainly have the technology. The reason why we haven't seen this already is because the political will. When you own the referees, you never lose a game. The fossil fuel industry owns the referees. They're able to, to uh, pump millions of dollars into the pockets of, of politicians to get them to turn a blind eye. That's why we haven't seen it move forward the way that it should. But those of us that are not owned by these industries, that are not paid for by these industries, can say we can look at other ideas. We can look at what other states are doing to already move themselves into that direction that, can, that have cleaned up the pollution, that have begun to adapt solar energy, um, wind energy, water energy. Um, they have begun to adjust their programs so that they can clean up their environment and create millions of jobs at the same time. So we can, it can be done, it will be done with the right uh, people in place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Perkins, you'll have one and one and a half minutes to answer. Thank you very much. And thank you all for having me here. Again, Mayor Perkins is, is really sorry, couldn't be here with you. And um, I, I just wanna encourage people a couple things before I get to the answer. Number one, um, you know, we're, we're looking at another storm and just wish everyone safety and strength and grace. Um, you know, early voting starts very soon. We want you to vote as early as possible. So it reduces the pressure on election day. Uh, you can go to perkinsforla.com to learn more about the campaign. There's going to be a lot of exciting events and opportunities to connect with the mayor in the coming weeks. He is ballot number 11. So now to the question, uh, we don't have to choose between putting food on the table and clean air and water. This year alone, 100,000 oil and gas workers laid off. Um, we can offer folks immediate opportunities to use their skills cleaning up some of the challenges of the, of the messes that have been made. 
Um, and Louisiana can develop new industries and continue to be a world-class producer of seafood, energy, and agriculture. Um, set in the earlier answers, listen to the experts, get rid of subsidies, set achievable targets, move fast, measure, and adjust. So absolutely support the goal of 100% clean by 2050 with a just transition that takes care of communities and workers that have been left behind or sick and hurting. People like the folks in St. James and St. John's Paris, listen to local leaders and community activists in those areas, work with the governor, uh, make sure the Department of Environmental Quality strengthens our enforcement of air and water. And then at the federal level, we need a federal government that puts Louisiana first and not last. Thank you all, be well, vote early. Thank you. And Mr. Winstrup, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I gotta thank you. Um, a 31 year old oil and gas worker with two kids, I believe should be able to finish out his life in the industry. I believe that somebody in their twenties needs to think about retraining for the future. That's why I support zero emissions by 2055. Uh, and, I, and I believe in the science to get there. I've taught young scientists. I'm proud of the people who I've taught who've gone into the scientific field and we need to believe in them. We already have cheaper micro nuclear technology uh, that's being developed, that's safer, that will help us bridge that gap. Uh, we need to be realistic about solar and wind in our state and knowing that we do not have the highest solar and the highest wind uh, capabilities. And so we need to be in Louisiana at the forefront of manufacturing uh, sectors um, for those industries to make sure that we are providing jobs for folks. We also need to electrify our school bus fleet nationwide in 10 years. We can do that. That's going to put a lot of people to work. We need to electrify our car fleet by 2040. And those are going to get us a huge segment of the way toward uh, zero emissions by 2055. Okay. okay. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I'd like to thank all our participants and I'll pass it back to Claire. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates and thank you to Ron. We have time for uh, some audience questions for our candidates. We have three candid three questions and we have three groups. So how we're going to do this is I'm going to ask the first question um, and our moderator for our first group um, who is on gel will moderate and facilitate getting the answer for the LPSC candidates. And then I will ask a second question that will be for the congressional candidates and Pooja will moderate that. And then the third will be for our senatorial candidates and Duran will moderate that. So the first question is, um, I'm Actually, sorry, just, if I could jump in. I think we decided one minute for these questions. Oh, right, one yeah. Answer. Thank you, Penny. Uh, you have one minute to answer. The first question I think we've already asked the Louisiana, um, this is a question, do you take campaign industry related uh, money? I think we've already asked that. So. I'm going to ask this question of the first group, Angel. The question is, do you support Louisiana Constitution Amendment number five? All right, so do we have Mr. Bortfield here? Or did we lose Mr. Bortfield? I don't think we have Mr. Bortfield anymore. All right, so Mr. Bourne, um, do you support Constitutional Amendment 5 uh, why, or proposed Constitutional Amendment 5? Why or why not? You have one minute to answer. All right, I'll come back to Mr. Bourne. Um, Mr. Pearson? Is he still here? All right, I don't think Mr. Warren is by his computer and I do not think Mr. Pearson's here anymore. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think what we're gonna do is move on to the second group. Uh, and this is our congressional candidates. And 
the question that I have for them is a kind of a long question. And, and um, I think the background is that Louisiana state is fragile and climate change is affecting our state greatly. Uh, it's expecting, affecting our economy, our infrastructure, our culture, and the fabric of our communities. What steps do you support to ensure our response to climate crisis is holistic and is equitable? One minute. How about, yes, hi. Um, how about we start with Ms. Dugas? Would you like to answer first? Sure. Um, Louisiana, you're right, and it is fragile. Um, a lot of what we need to do is, is to educate the current workers that are in the uh, oil and gas industry. And I'm a big, uh, I'm for vocational technical schools because we're moving into a new time and a new era. And why take somebody that's been there 30 years and fire them because they can't learn something new. Not everyone's cut out for a four-year four college. We need to start with education. Let's retrain these people. And let's hold the corporation accountable to repair the damage to our coastal wetlands. They need to be responsible for it. They need to repair it. And we need to work together. Because if we go our separate ways, nothing will ever get done. And water will be at the I-10 on, all this will be underwater, south of I-10. Not gonna let it happen. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr. Kearney, would you like to uh, give an answer? You have one minute. Yeah, thank you. So um, I think directly I, uh, what we need to do is to address the activities of what the uh, Army Corps of Engineers are doing to our uh, uh, which is causing most of our wetland problems. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the lack of allowing the Mississippi to drain naturally as it was um, is, is causing a big issue. The intercoastal waterways uh, of constantly dredging and allowing for housing developments and stuff in those areas are draining the water table and uh, causing the problem. Um, and I think that we need to look at ways to uh, uh, let the cost of living down there be really applied to the citizens that choose to be down there and not cause the uh, 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 a free ride of, of reduced price of, of costs uh, by spreading the cost across the state. Um, I'm referring to insurance uh, uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, now we'll be going on to Mr. Belden Batiste. Uh, would you like to answer the question? You have one minute. Can, can you repeat the question, please? Claire, could you repeat the question? Um, yes. Um, climate change is affecting Louisiana's economy, infrastructure, culture, and the fabric of our community. What steps do you support to ensure our response to climate crisis is holistic and is equitable. What steps I would support? Well, I would get with community um, driven groups that have more experience than me. And then I'll have like experienced people like scientists and all that. And I'll go with those steps that um, the group support. And mostly because my campaign is about the people and what the people need, what they want, working with all these climate change groups that's that's fighting for righteous and justice and everything, you know. So I I support that, and if it comes down to money, I'll fight for um, taking some of the national defense money or taking some of the tax money and fighting the best way to deal with that climate change and the um, the, the climate change. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we will now be moving on to uh, Mr. Richard Torgano. Could you please uh, give your answer? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, uh, I guess I'm not in the picture, but uh, uh, what I would do is defer this uh, information to more technical people who have better answers. But what I have suggested is that you know, we read. We, yeah, oh, am I here or what? Hello. All candidates, I'm sorry about that. All candidates, please make sure you mute yourself. Um, I'm sorry about that. We'll restart your timer. Please go ahead, Mr. Torgano. Uh, yes, as I was saying is that uh, I don't have a specific answer. I defer to the people who have more knowledge and then this, but uh, whatever we do, we'll need money. And so what I have suggested in my website and on my platform is to redistribute the uh, uh, the gasoline tax, which is about 18, 18 cents, raise it to 20 cents and put it on the oil and gas industry and take it off the uh, pumps that we all pay. Um, with this redistribution, we could uh, have $1 billion for coastal restoration, a billion dollars to uh, redo our electrical grid and billion dollars for uh, uh, bridges. So you know, whatever need, whichever decided we'll need money. And so redistribution of that, that gasoline tax would help. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, the final person to answer will be Mr. Williams. Are you on here? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, please go ahead. Sure, I, I think I think the, the, the next step starts with new leadership. And with new leadership comes new ideas and new initiatives. Um, we understand that the Green New Deal um, is technologically possible, um, but we need to appreciate and turn attention to whether or not the policy is possible here within the next 10 years as we look from 10 to 50. Um, and that's where it starts. It, start, it starts by um, adopting, not adopting, but rather electing new le leadership. And with that comes a, a lot of new things that are designed to be disruptive to the status quo. And um, th th that's the gist of it. Thank you to all the candidates for your answers. Uh, I'll pass it back to Claire uh, to give more questions. Okay, our last question will be for the senatorial candidates. And the question is this, what is your opinion of, and I'm gonna say this in quotation marks because that's how it's written. What is your opinion of the so-called Green New Deal? End of quotes. And I will turn this over to Deron. Thank you. Mr. Billy, you're up first. You have one minute to answer. Mr. Billy. Yeah, I was unmuting, sorry. This technological challenges. The thing is, this is a very complex issue and it's 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 almost hard to, to do it in a minute. And I think it's unfair that you get such a complex issue and to, to go through just like all these questions or they're, they're compounded complex issues and no matter how you answer it, you can't fully grasp the entire concept in, in, in one minute. So just to make the short of it, I mean, this is almost unenforceable. The Green New Deal is, is a, a, a plan to get to clean energy, which we need to do. There's no doubt that we have to change and reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, but we're not looking far enough into the future. Just as with eliminating emissions, we're having battery operated cars that gives us a whole new problem with disposing of batteries once they end their life. And so we need to think longer and more forward thinking in, in solving our problems than just immediate today. All right, thank you. We are now here from Mr. Mendoza. You'll have one minute. To me, it is a great new opportunity to create a better economy and to provide millions of jobs. And the Green New Deal can easily provide 50 million new jobs, which will create $1 trillion, $1 trillion a year. And this will pay for Medicare for all is going to pay for college education. 
and you know it means new roads for Louisiana and uh, 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 a light metro rail that can uh, make more jobs. So it's a it's a great uh, economic opportunity, and we need to take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to Mr. Pierce. One minute. Okay. Well, certainly I, I am an advocate of the Green New Deal. Um, as a matter of fact, um, a few days ago, I was able to speak with the Sunrise Movement and they talked about a Southern version of the Green New Deal, which um, is specific to the issues that are facing our uh, environment here. Now, whether you believe it's possible to be done or not, the type of aggressive measures listed in the Green New Deal are certainly the direction that we have to go um, in order to save our planet, save our environment, um, and, and have a future for ourselves and our children. So absolutely, the, the, the details of the Green New Deal, we can talk about um, if you think it's implementable or not. But this is the type of aggressive approach we must take now to reverse or to, to stop or slow down the effects of climate change brought on by human interaction. We know, we talked to every, most of the scientific organizations have said that it's scientific, uh, uh, I mean, it's human interaction that's causing the sea levels to rise and, and uh, the frequency of storms and uh, the, the rising temperatures. So we can take aggressive measures now to, to end those effects and we have to do that. And that's what the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal speaks to. So of course I support it. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Perkins campaign, you'll have one minute. Thank you. And um, thank you again for having me. I'm, I'm not Adrian Perkins, so I can't give his answer. Um, but you can go to Perkins4LA.com and you can learn more about his policies and the campaign. I think what we talked about here tonight uh, and his record, you'll, you'll see he's someone that cares about jobs, who cares about justice, who cares about cleaning up the messes of the past and planning for the future, someone who listens to the experts, whether it's about this virus or climate change. Um, Louisiana is home to many of the architects of the original New Deal. Uh, I know Mayor Perkins believes we need to put people in Washington that put Louisiana first, who get things done, who stop the political games that are making us all sick. And if you look at this race, um, we think that Adrian Perkins is the best candidate to take on Senator Cassidy and make sure Louisiana has real representation in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we'll have Mr. Winstrup. You'll have one minute. Thank you. Um, in the next 15 years, Congress is going to pass a significant climate change bill. Our current representation, Senators Kennedy and Cassidy, have been a hard no on any sort of compromise in the last four and six years. And we can be sure they won't be part of any negotiations to bring jobs and to bring green industry to Louisiana. We need leadership that is going to fight for Louisianans, leadership that has been in Louisiana for the last decade, serving Louisiana families and Louisiana workers. As your next US Senator, I will make sure that we empower workers with a $15 minimum wage, that we empower communities with an opportunity to get into the fastest growing sector of our economy. I'm here asking for your vote and your support on November 3rd. I'm Peter Wenstrup, ballot number 15. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll now pass it back to our moderator, Claire. Thank you, Ron. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I certainly learned a great deal tonight listening to all the candidates who talk about their views on climate and racial justice. Um, you guys are a very talented group of candidates and we all thank you so much for sharing your views on climate, racial justice and the important issues uh, that affect Louisiana's environment. To our audience, a great big enthusiastic thank you for being concerned about our climate and for taking time, making time to participate tonight. Thank you so much. We hope that this forum has been informative, educational, and we hope that this will help you to select your candidates to vote for on November 3rd. Thank you all so very much. This has been extraordinarily informative and educational. Good night.
Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.